consider the following keyboard and monitor. Now let's just say that what we're going to do is to actually hit the A key on the keyboard and you can see it's lowercase a. Now what that will do, it will place in some kind of editor on the monitor A as you can see here, lowercase a. If we now put the caps lock on and now we press the same key, i.e. the A key as you can see here, then we'll get capital A appearing on the monitor in some kind of editor on the monitor. What we have here, we have the mechanical movement of a key on a keyboard resulting in the character that that key represents appearing on the monitor and here we can see it for capital A. Now of course this is an involved process that involves the electronics of the computer interacting with the software of the computer. Underlying this process are codes. In other words if you type in capital A a code is generated in binary and that binary code is used to inform the computer as to the character it is to display on the actual monitor. Let's consider this code by looking at this particular table here. You can see it's actually got four columns. The first column is the character column and we're going to be looking at character A, capital A, uppercase A. Now this has a binary pattern as shown here. Now within computing it is usual for human beings to try and remember binary patterns using hexadecimal numbers. And the hexadecimal number for this binary pattern is 41. Now elsewhere on my YouTube channel I show you how to convert between binary and hexadecimal. Maybe have a look at that if you're not quite sure what this means here. But of course we're used to working in decimal or deanery. And if we were to look at this binary pattern in our number system, the one we're used to using every day, then it has the number 65. So when you hit capital A on a computer, in fact what will happen you'll get a binary pattern which in our number system we can represent by 65. 65. So this binary pattern here is 65 but it doesn't mean it's the quantity 65. It means that in this context it represents the character of capital or uppercase A. If we look to the character B, uppercase B, then it has the following binary pattern. Now in hexadecimal that is in fact 4-2 and in our number system it is in fact 66 so when you type in capital B at the keyboard the number that generated in our number system is 66 so 66 is the binary pattern because in fact this is an our number representation of the binary pattern that you see in front of you for capital B if we continue and we have a look at capital C then it has this particular binary pattern which has this hexadecimal number which in fact has in our number system 67 representing it. If you look at the deanery column you can see it's 65, 66, 67. It goes up in sequence. So it doesn't take much imagination to realize that D, capital D, would be 68. But we can carry on with this and we can see if we carry on to Z then what we have for Z is the binary pattern here the hexadecimal number 5a and the deanery number 90. So every uppercase character has their own binary pattern to represent it and each pattern goes up by one. You can see that is easier for us to look at in deanery 65, 66, 67 all the way up to 90. So every character has their own binary pattern to represent them. Now what's interesting about this, if we type in capital A, it's got the value of 65 as we've already discussed. But if we look at the next table, if we type in lowercase a, it has a different binary pattern and its value in deanery is 9797. And lowercase b is one bigger, 98. Lowercase c is one bigger, 99. And we can go all the way up to lowercase z, which in our number system is 122. But again, we've got this principle of a sequence. You see, if you know A is 97, then you know B is going to be represented by 98. But the key again is that every character here has their own binary pattern. And you can see that we have this definite sequence appearing. What we're now going to do, we're going to have a look at the following function, ORD. Now what this particular function is capable of doing is this. If you give it a character, it'll tell you what its number representation is. So for example, here you can see I've got capital A. I've shown it in red and those quotes 
simply are telling me that we have a string. Now, those of you who have done other programming languages, Python does not have a character type. When you have one letter like this, it's still regarded as a string, a string of length one. So strings can be numerous characters in length, but this is a character which we refer to as a string of length one because we don't have the character type in Python. But putting that aside, what this particular function will do is if you supply A as an input, it will tell you what its number is. And you can see the number is 65, as we've just been looking at with the table we've been observing. If I now go on to look at B, capital B, and we put that into the function, we should be clear that it's going to be 66. So 66 will come out because we know there's a sequence here. And of course, we then go all the way to capital Z. And when we put capital Z in, if you can remember from the table, it is actually 90. But if you couldn't remember, it's easy to work out. You know how many letters there are in the alphabet. And if A is 65, it's quite easy to work out what Z will be by adding the appropriate number to 65. And of course, if we now take this function again and put in lowercase a, well, if you remember lowercase a, had the number 97 from the tables and if I was to make any recommendation to you here you need to memorize what the number is for lowercase a i.e. 97 and for uppercase a it is in fact 65 but if I put a now into this function I get the 97 out now of course if I carry on and I put lowercase b then I know it's going to be 98 I don't remember that one, but I know it's one bigger than the one for lowercase a. So what I will get out in this particular case is obviously 98. Now, if I continue with this, I'll then come up to Z and I'm going to put Z into here. And of course, that's 122. So we can see that every particular character has a number, as you can see from these examples. Now let's consider this. This is a semicolon. Now a semicolon is a key on a keyboard and it will display on the monitor. So does this have a number? Well the answer is yes. If you put a semicolon in what it will give you out is 59. And of course a full stop, a comma, an open bracket will all have their own number. And if you want to know what it is you can use this particular function. Or you can download the appropriate tables off the internet to tell you what the codes are for all of these characters. Of course if we look at the keyboard here and we consider pressing the spacebar, when you press a spacebar, this is what you get between words when you're typing in a word processor. And of course, you don't see anything on the monitor. You see a gap. You see a gap between the words. So if I was going to represent that, I'm representing it here with an open and closing quote. And in between there, there's a gap where I would have pressed the spacebar or you would have pressed the spacebar. Now, if that goes into this particular function, it'll give you the number that represents that, and it's 32. You see, you've had mechanical movement there of a key on the keyboard. You must give it a number, and the number is 32, because the computer needs to know where it's to put its space when it displays anything. And, of course, it needs something to represent the spacebar, and that is 32 so it knows to move the cursor a space and not put anything for us to see on the actual monitor let's say you type the following at the keyboard a b c z in uppercase then a space a b c z in lowercase now when this is typed in every keystroke would have generated the binary pattern associated with each keystroke so for A, for example, it would be a binary pattern that we can represent in our number system as 65. B would be one bigger, 66. C, 67. And Z would be a few bigger at 90. And then, of course, we've got a space. Now, the space will be the number 32. Then we come on to lowercase a, which is 97. B, 98. C, 99. And finally, Z will be a few numbers bigger because of the number of letters in the alphabet, and it will be 122. Now, what we can do, we can write a small computer program to show us whether this, in fact, is all true. So here, for example, you can see I've got a simple computer program where here I've created a variable called character. I've assigned to that the one-length string of A, so capital A 
is inside this variable called character. And here you can see that I am now passing that variable that contains capital A to this function odd. And what that will do, it'll work out what the number is for capital A. And then it'll assign that to the character code, which is a variable waiting to receive the number that's returned from the odd function. And this particular line, well, what that will do, it'll output the character, which is character capital A, and it'll output the character code, i.e. the number that represents capital A. So the runtime will look like this. You can see it's got A, it's got the space there that the print statement puts in for us, and then it's got 65, which is the number that represents capital A inside a computer. If I now have a look at the same program again, but here you can see I've just changed this to capital B. So I'm expecting the output when this runs to be B with 66. And if we have a look, we can see here it's B, the space, and then 66. And if I go further with this and now I put in Z, then it's the same program and I'm expecting it to show me Z and what it number is. And we can see it's Z and 90. Now if I continue with this, and here I've got the same program, but on this occasion I've put in lowercase a, and when I run this I expect it to give me a and the number that represents that, and if you remember, I recommended you remember what that was, and it's 97. So here we can see it gives us out a and 97. So if I continue now, I'm making this lowercase b, and of course I'm expecting this to be a b followed by 98, a b, 98, as you can see in the actual output and then I'm going to put in Z and when I put in Z and it's lowercase Z remember then I will expect it to show me Z and what its number representation is and we can see it's Z and 122 representing Z now what I want to stress here I'm showing these numbers in our number systems but please realize that in fact they're binary that is actually representing these characters inside a computer so when you type anything on a computer and you say type an email then you send it to somebody across the world somewhere, they still have the same representations for these letters. So if they were to receive the binary pattern 97 and that was part of the text of your email, then that when it gets displayed on the monitor will be lowercase a. So there is an agreement that we all use these same codes and they're called ASCII codes, ANSI code, Unicode. There's many different kinds, but all of those codes will have lowercase a being 97, uppercase a being 65. And there's more to this particular process, but in this video, I'm only introducing it because we're really concentrating on this function odd. Now we can continue with this, and here you can see that I'm making the character a semicolon and when I run that it'll tell me what the number is for the semicolon and we can see it's 59 here you can see I've put a space between these two quotes so the character is now representing the pressing of the space bar if you want to think of it in that way so of course when we get the output the space is here the space is put in also by the print statement that's why it appears to be two spaces but the actual space is in this position here then the space of the print statement, and then the number that represents the character of a space, 32. And that's one worth remembering. Now, if we continue and we remind ourselves of this again, here's A, B, Z in uppercase and A, B, C and Z in lowercase. And these are the numbers that actually represent them. There's the 32, there's the 97, all the way up to the Z being 122. Bearing that in mind, what you can see here, I've created a variable called characters, and I've assigned to that A, B, C, Z, space A, B, C, Z. And what we actually have, I'm going to represent here as characters with A, B, C, Z, a space A, B, C, Z, as you can see here. Now, this is a string. Now, here we have a for loop, which we've covered earlier in the playlist. And what this for loop will do, it will enable us to execute these program statements here a number of times. 
and the number of times will be equal to the number of characters in this particular string characters. So when we first go into the loop, character is going to be capital A. Now that capital A is given to odd, and of course this will find the number 65. We'll give that to the character code 65. So when we come onto this print statement here, what it will output is capital A and its character code, which will be 65. Then we go back and now character is capital B. So this now will be capital B. We take the order of it. We get the number 66, which is put into the character code. And of course, this here will now output B and also 66. And it'll go round this loop a number of times equal to the number of characters we can see in the string. So what we will get at the output is this. So you can see that A is 65, B is 66. If I go down, you can see the space is 32. If I go right to the end, you can see lowercase z is 122. So it behaves exactly as we expected. If we carry on now and we have a look at this particular line, because I'm particularly interested in this odd character, what in fact we can see is if I go back to this diagrammatic view of a function we had earlier, that this character is actually an input to the function. That's the letter we're putting into the function. What we will get out is actually put to the character code. So we can see the relationship between the code and this visual diagram that I have to represent a function. If we carry on and look at it again in a little bit more detail, this is a string repre representing one Unicode character. In other words, A, B, C, a space, and so on. This returns an integer representing the Unicode point of that character. So if it was capital A, it's 65, it's a capital B, it's 66 it will return. And of course, we assign that number to the character code. Going on further and looking at this, this is a built-in function. This comes with Python. It's available for us to use in all of our programs. This is a string variable, and we've been using this string variable for strings of one character length. And of course, this one here is an integer variable. When it's assigned, it will be assigned an integer, so it becomes an integer variable. Before we go on, however, what I want to stress here is here you can see you've got a character of zero. Now it's very tempting to think, well, won't the binary pattern for that be zero? Well, in fact, no, it's this one here. Now, what you have to realize, this is a key press on the keyboard. It's the zero key on the keyboard you're pressing. And it'll have a number to represent it. And that's the binary pattern number that represents it. And it's 48. So when you hit one on the keyboard, this is the binary pattern that represents one, which is 49 in our number system. Two is therefore 50, and we can see nine is 57. So all of these have their own binary pattern because these are text. They're not numeric values that we're going to add up and multiply. So zero character has this binary pattern, not all zeros. If it was a number, and you were dealing with zero in a program that was doing some math, then obviously the binary pattern would be all zeros, but it's not. It's dealing with keystrokes, and it's dealing with what gets displayed on the visual display unit. Therefore, when we run this program, and I let character equal zero, then what I will get at the output is a zero and 48. When I run the same program, and this time make character equal to one, we get one, and it's telling me the character code that represents 1 is 49, of course, the binary equivalent of 49. And here, just for completeness, I'm making the character equal 9, and of course, that will be 9 here and 57, the binary pattern of 57, whatever that is. I mean, it's quite easy to work out. Check out the supporting website for these videos, and also consider subscribing to the YouTube channel and get an automatic update every time I upload a new video. Also consider subscribing to the Google Plus Circle that relates to these videos.